Well, that was nice to hear. I thought about having James Taylor, but I like uh, letting the lady go to the same. So, so uh, what does it mean to be a friend? And where did the word come from? Anyway, it was interesting to discover uh, in my research that the word has had a consistent meaning and use for more than 1,500 years. It's Germanic in origin and has existed in the English language since its founding in Old English. At that time, friend in Old English was the word friand, which was the present participle of the verb freon, which meant to love. The root of the verb was fry, F-R-I, which meant to like, to love, or to be affectionate to. And we can still see this verb in use today on the day of the week, Friday, or day of frig, which is devoted to the Germanic goddess of love, Frigg, who was Norse god Odin's wife. In Old English, a friend defined a relationship with strong feelings independent of sexual or family love, practically the same meaning it has today, well over a thousand years later. It's, uh, it's interesting to note that friend is also seen as the antonym or opposite of enemy. And because one was either an enemy or a friend, it was during that time that the word friend also came to define loyalty. But enough of the etymology. This is supposed to be a sermon, not a lecture. I'm going to talk about friends today. I've attended this church my entire life, and and many of you in the congregation today are my friends, and quite a few of us have known each other for many, many years. In fact, uh, in some ways, practically our entire lives. So I'd like you to think of this as a conversation with a friend. And, you know, you can listen, you can react, you can nod. If you disagree, talk to me later. Um, So how many of us are still learning how to listen? Oh, yeah, show of hands. I know my son did that earlier when I was practicing last night. So learning how to be a friend. Sometimes it's not easy to show interest in others instead of talking about ourselves. I know I'm certainly guilty of that. Getting people to talk about themselves makes you seem that much more interesting and engaging. And then all you have to do is listen. Maybe the next time you run into someone, instead of how are you, ask what's new and then wait for the answer. C.S. Lewis said about friendship, a friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. How many of you have had that kind of an experience? I know I've had that. When I was growing up back in the 1950s, the first friends I remember were family, brothers and my cousins. And I don't really think that's changed much over the years. As we grew, our friendships came from neighbors, church, and school. We sat next to our friends if the teacher would let us, and we learned together and discovered things we liked and didn't like. We discovered that people were like us and some were different. If they liked the same things we did, we sort of hung out together. If they were different, we were either curious about them or we ignored them completely. And that hasn't changed much either, has it? Especially with kids. As the years passed, our world started to expand. We learned about different cultures and races, and maybe our friendships grew in different ways, but usually not. Most of us were insulated, with friends developed from our own little part of the world. Where did the friends from your childhood come from? Many times it was from a team you were a part of. Maybe it was a sport. Many kids developed their friendships through sports, um, but I didn't. I grew up in the country and organized youth activities were few and far between. But I was a Boy Scout and the shared experiences of camping and hiking and other outdoor activities created a strong bond. One of my best friends through school was in Boy Scouts with me, and we reconnected a couple of years ago, and the first words out of his mouth were, do you remember when we used to sing those duets at campfires together? I certainly did. I was the guy that sang the harmony, and I still can. 
And I've spoken of it many times over the years. The two songs that we sang were Yankee Doodle Dandy and You're a Grand Old Flag. Now in college, we all came of age with roommates. I'll bet many of you still have friendships that were developed in the dorms at college. As I've mentioned these various phases in my life, you probably have also thought of similar times in your own life, remembering all of those who have touched your life and all the friendships that have made you the person you are today. All along, as we grew up, we would make friends. We would also end friendships. Maybe someone treated you unfairly, or maybe you were the cause. You might have been what would be considered popular. What made you popular? Did that mean you had lots of friends? Do you still have those friends? Then suddenly we're adults, out of college making our way in the world, perhaps staying in contact with our friends, but often feeling like we're starting all over again. Fellow workers become our friends, and suddenly we realize the fragility of those friendships if we lose our job or get laid off or get transferred. So what is it that creates friends, especially as adults? There needs to be a connection something you both love. Perhaps it's gardening, maybe it's cooking, or maybe you both just seem to look at the world in a similar way and somehow share a delicious secret. Church is certainly one place where there's an opportunity to meet people with similar likes and dislikes and interests and worldview. Look at the generational success of church guilds. Can you hear me okay? Look at Fountain Street. Look at Parent Circle and the success of you know, this Parent Circle. Think of the guilds that have been parts of the past where people like mine have gotten together as friends. As adults also, we become friends with the parents of the friends our kids have made. And we've developed a lot of friends that way. As adults, many of us have a special friendship with our spouses. Here's one example, and I have to give you a quick aside. Um, Evie was out on the, the, the porch last night planting. We were on vacation for two weeks, and we finally decided to get plants to plant because they would have died if we were gone. And uh, I noticed Evie looking at something and looking at something. And uh, I said, what's going on? She said, well, there's a bird that's caught up in a tree. And it was a cedar waxwing that somehow had gotten its foot caught in the tree. And it was flapping around and flapping around and flapping around. And there was another cedar waxwing sitting on the branch right next to it, waiting patiently, and had a dragonfly in its mouth. And I got the binoculars out, and I looked, and as I waited, and, and, and then the cedar waxwing waited and waited, and then finally ate the dragonfly itself. So, and I'm sorry to say that the morning, this morning the bird is still up there, so I don't know, it's far too, away, too far away for us to reach or to help. But um, I love birds, and I always have. And I probably caught that from my mother. But there's a warm delight when my wife calls out that the indigo buntings are back at our feeder mid-spring. And uh, they only come through, uh, working their way north and stop at our home for just a day or two. But that's part of our friendship, I think. We share that. We're also fortunate to have a group of friends tied together by our common sons. Families with boys. Um, it's very different if you have a boy and girl or if you have all girls. If it's boys, we sort of feel sorry for the moms sometimes. But we gather up in the woods. We go camping. Um, the boys still disappear off into the bogs and swamps and return mud-caked, bug-bitten, and exhilarated. For me personally, Boy Scouts has been a great place to develop friendships. Men, adult men, have a hard time developing true friendships, it seems. Guys seem caught up in some type of macho competition, sort of the excuse the expression, how high can you pee on the wall thing. Um, and, you know, who can outlie, who can out-earn, who can accumulate the most toys, who's one-upping the other over and over and over. And I don't seem to subscribe to that much. 
But Scouts is different. It's a great place for guys to be guys, and there isn't the underlying competitive pressure. I guess maybe it's because we're there for something other than ourselves. We're doing it for our sons, and it's fun. While I have a lot of appreciation and great respect for coaches, and I've coached myself all too often coaches of sports activities or trying to relive something from their earlier years. And it's difficult to develop true trans friendships in face of all that competition. Sorry about the light, I'll fix that later. In scouting, we're helping our sons find themselves and develop skills they'll use the rest of their lives, even if they don't realize it at the time. So. The parents, and especially the men, stick around as adult leaders, because, and they've become some of the best friends of my adulthood. Now, perhaps we're fortunate that we live in Cascade, and the adults involved are most often professionals. But uh, through the training and the hours of shared experience, sitting in our adult circle away from the boys, we've become a band of brothers, good-naturedly jibing, cajoling, ribbing each other, and the laughter comes easily and often. And the boys pick up on that respect and affection that we have for each other. I've, uh, I've said more than once that scouting is a great way to meet men, and there just aren't that many places outside of work or church where that's possible. Yet at every age, some friendships endure and other friendships die, ebbing and flowing with time. As we move on, we try to stay in touch, we visit sometimes, we send Christmas cards, we exchange pictures of our kids. Some we drift away from, and yet there are some in your life probably, and in my life too, you always seem to be able to connect with, even if we haven't talked to them in years. It's as if you were never apart. I'll share a recent experience I've had about a friend. He'd uh, been my best man when Evie and I got married. We'd met when we were in high school working at our first jobs as dishwashers at a nursing home. We were both on the debate team. We both liked to sing. We both enjoyed the poetry of E.E. E. Cummings and Robert Frost, which is a nice dichotomy. I can't imagine someone else would actually like that. We uh, found we laughed and enjoyed many of the same things. His father was a professor at Calvin, and uh, we went, he went to LaGrave Avenue Christian Reformed Church, and I attended Fountain Street Church but we hung out together all through high school. We went our separate ways to college and we lost touch with each other. And then we bumped into each other 10 years later, each of us fresh from a divorce. It was as if we'd never parted. There was an easy comfort. He was now a lawyer. I had started my creative services business, but we made dinner together, we golfed, we traveled together. Then he remarried and had two sons and I was a welcome member of their family as their sons grew up. Over the years, our paths diverged as we became busier with family and career. And Evie and I started a family, and he and I drifted apart. But we get together occasionally, perhaps at a bar to play some pool and catch up. In the past couple of years, his practice has been very busy, and we don't see each other as much. But we met for lunch recently, and it was as if the years had melted away. <laughs> 